Well, hello. Um, I've heard these were really good scopes. This is a Sencor SC61. Uh, managed to find one on eBay for $40. Run me about 60 with the shipping. Um, had a bad volume, or not volume, but uh, power switch. And other than that, all I had to do was give it a really good cleaning. And it sat on my bench because I didn't have any probes for it. Um, so I ordered these ones off eBay. And this is the P6100, 100 megahertz. They're about $20 for a package of two. And in my Sencor manual, there is a schematic for the probes that they use. These won't work direct because there are times 10 that go with the Sencor. Um, so I could just turn the probe to the times 10 setting and it'd work fine. However, the Sencor comes with this nice little DC input voltage. And over here on each channel, you can select the digital readout for DC volts. But I did not have the Sencor probe. So I go back on eBay. Cannot find any. So I ordered these probes from Jameco. This is the P6100, which is 100 megahertz. I think that's probably the max bandwidth for this uh, scope. And I'm going to show you how I modified them to work with my Sencor SC61. Okay, so first up here we have the schematic of the uh, P6100 probe. Um, has the time 10 switch in the probe itself. The other end with the BNC connector has a 100 ohm resistor, a 50 ohm resistor, and the 20 picofad picofarad uh, trimmer cap for compensation. Now this will only work if it's used for AC. The DC setup on the Sencor is slightly different. So this is what the Sencor looks like. You have your typical 9 meg input resistance, but then down on the DC side you have a 13.5 meg resistance. This feeds into the DC side, 1.5 mega ohm resistance. The AC side has a 1 mega ohm resistance. You'll notice there is no times 10 switch on these probes. So, when I look at the schematic, I thought, well, I've got the 9 meg in the other probe. I can just add a 4.7 behind it to make a 13.5 meg for the DC side. So that's what I did. I got a 4.7 meg resistor and hooked it up. This is the schematic of what I came up with when I adapted it. Um, instead of having the DC side connected directly to the probe, I connected it to the end of the 9 meg and changed this to a 4.7, which technically should have worked correct. However, when it's hooked up to the AC side with the mega ohm resistance in there, it throws the DC voltages off. So I had to go back and redesign it. This is what we're shooting for for my Sencor probe. And now I will uh, disassemble and you can watch how I took this apart and made it uh, the same as the Sencor original probe. Okay, so this is the P6100 probe. You have the uh, BNC end and the probe end. Probe end has the 9 meg ohm resistor with the 1 and times 10 switch on it. So to figure out how to get this apart, you can take this rubber end off, like so, slide it back. This is the compensation end. You slide that back and there's your little circuit board. Now you have, now you can see this, down here is a 50 ohm resistor, the 20 picofarad trimmer, and up here is a 100 ohm inline resistor. So to modify, I removed this resistor completely, left the 50 ohm and the compensation in.
Okay, so we have the 100 ohm resistor removed. And we will need the 9 meg ohm resistor. And since I'm old, I always verify these. I especially dislike the blue ones because they're even harder to figure out with the color code than these are. However, you can get this handy little device off eBay for about $10 to measure the resistance. So you want to cut your uh, resistors, the uh, two 9, nine mega ohm resistors, just like this. Short leads on two ends, long on one, and the other bent almost back around. And then they'll be installed as proceeding. First one is installed. You leave the second leg unsoldered until you get the second resistor put on the same pad. Okay, second one is installed. The reason we have to do this way is because of the space limitations on the sleeve that slides over the trimmer. Okay, second resistor is soldered down. Let's see if I can turn this so you can see how it's positioned. Very cramped quarters in there. And the third resistor we're going to solder to the other end over here to make our uh, DC lead. Okay, there's the third resistor soldered into place. And next we build our wire and, and uh, banana plug for the DC plug-in. Now to do this part, I uh, want to cut right here behind the blue ring on the first uh, flexible edge of the cover. Now for the uh, lead, let's see if I can find the one I built. I have about a six inch wire. Now this is a regular, let me get this out of here. This is a regular banana plug, but I just uh, peeled the flexible fins off the end, and it fits right into the uh, DC input on the send core. Okay, so we notched the uh, rubber sleeve, and making sure we put the plug in the correct way, ran the lead through. It's going to hang out here. We're going to put a piece of uh, heat shrink over it and then trim the resistor and solder those together. Okay, so we got it soldered on there. You want to make sure your insulated heat shrink is on the wire and that both of them run through the sleeve. So now we'll heat shrink and reassemble and I'll show you what it looks like when it's done. Then we'll take some voltage measurements. Now I don't know if you can see this. But there is a notch in the end of the sleeve there. <clears throat> i get my pointer here. Right there is the notch. So we're going to put the insulated wire through there. And then put the sleeve back over and the rubber cap and we'll be done. This is what it looks like when it's all routed correctly, making sure there's no shorts, and we'll assemble. So this is what it looks like reassembled. We've got our mini banana plug. Now I don't particularly like these. It's one of my eBay mistakes. Uh, the screw is directly connected to the hot side, so I tend to uh, put some heat shrink over the top of these. But I went ahead and ordered more uh, banana plugs offline. I, I like the Panoma ones, but they're hard to find. Uh, but yeah, I don't like these screw together ones at all. Okay, there we go. Now insulated with some heat shrink. And we'll hook this up to the scope and see how it works. So we have the DC bench supply dialed in at 5.1 volts. Let's see if we can get it down to 1. 5 volts 
uh, connected to the probe. You want this on the one time setting since we already put a 9 meg inside the BNC connector. And we're hooked up to channel A. Gotta have the DC plugged in or it will not read. You do not have to have this on DC coupling. Now over here you want the DC volts button pushed. And right now we're just under 5 volts. So we're 4 hundredths of a volt off. Not too shabby I would say. So my thought on this is um, using the little tester machine here you can measure your 9 mega ohm resistors and find a pair to match up with the uh, 4.7 mega ohm resistors to get the correct reading on your your voltage. Uh, might take a little playing but you could get this highly accurate. Now another comment on this oscilloscope um, took up quite a bit of space but it does have quite a few features that I really came to appreciate later. One was, okay you've got the voltmeter here and over here you have push buttons for A and B channel. You can do peak to peak voltage if you're on AC and you can do the frequency measurement. Now my tests on the frequency measurement, they'd only ran up to a little over 50 megahertz before the frequency counter crapped out. And over here you have delta measurements where you can set the start and stop of any waveform on the screen and do like a capture on it. This is one of the very first microprocessor controlled scopes. And didn't quite know what I was buying when I got it, but I really like this now because I can eliminate three of my uh, uh, test bench pieces all in one unit here. Actually four if you count the, uh, the delta measurements. <coughs> Anywho, this is my bench. I've uh, home built a lot of this. There's my Bariac. Um, 20 amp supply. This is a switch mode power supply with a variable on it. I really don't care for these because they tend to blow up really easy and they're very noisy on radio repairs. This is a frequency counter I built with parts off of eBay for less than $100. Um, and then up here, I have my ICO collection. A whole bunch of stuff. So we got the capacitor tester. Just picked that one up. Substitution box. This is the 1214 or the 214. Uh, you get old like me, you really appreciate these big sweet meters. Uh, the 377 audio generator. It's really hard to find these without the mangled front panels. Uh, the 145 signal tracer. This is one I built out of an old Heath kit uh, RF generator. I think I picked it up for 20 bucks on eBay. Built a cabinet for it. And uh, what is this one? This is the 221, I believe. And then we have the sweet meter. We have capacitor checker. We have the 460 push-pull scope. We have the two or 315 signal generator. This one I here I built as a small version of the dyna load like Mr. Carlson has. Uh, this one will only go up to about 150 watts but it tests just about everything I've thrown at it. Uh, I've got my old 625 for test tubing, tube testing. And then down at this end, this is one of my favorites. This is another 460 or 425 oscilloscope, but this one is different. I ordered it from a lady in California, and when it arrived, I opened it up, and it did not look like the insides of that one. This one had 1193 tubes in it. I think that's what they are. Um, basically... Uh, single stage tubes. This one has the double stage tubes all in one. So there's about four less tubes in that one. However, here's my thoughts on this. This one, the 1193s, I think they're called, uh, run to a much higher frequency. They use these in radar installations when the tubes were still in use. And my thought on that was this was only 
when it came out of the box good up to maybe 100 megahertz or 100 kilohertz but the tubes will go much higher in frequency if I probably change the bandpass capacitors that are uh, going between stages so I'm going to experiment with that and I'll let you have a video if I can make it succeed anyway thanks for watching